check it out. Hello everyone and welcome to Bell Live 99 on the Prairie. I'm Vanita Sakar, one of your hosts. Now, it's time to check your watches. I've got a watch here, maybe the clock in your classroom. It's now 1.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time here on the great northwestern Minnesota grasslands and we're live. You, all of you, students and teachers, are about to experience a very exciting adventure here on the Blue Stem Prairie Preserve near Moorhead, Minnesota. And basically, it's what you see around me right here. It's a tall grass prairie, much like the Native Americans and early pioneers knew it, but there is so much more here, too. There's so much life out there that you're going to be seeing in the next hour, from mammals to insects, plants, flowers, even chickens. And on top of it all, you're going to see a fire out here on the prairie. That's right. I'm Belinda Jensen, one of your other hosts here on Bell Live from the prairie. And you know, fire used to rule this prairie. Thunderstorms would come rumbling across, and one strike of lightning would set all these dry grasses aflame. And hundreds of miles wide of flames would be moving at the speed of the wind, and they would devour everything in their path. Now figure this out. Kind of interesting. These fires also brought life and hardier species. The flames kept the prairie alive, maintaining its ecosystem. Now, how did they do that? Well, we have the answers for you, and we have Brian Winter, our fire expert. How you doing, Brian? I'm doing great. Hi. It's great to see you. We have about a half acre here, and we're going to burn it down during the show live. Very exciting. But before we do that, we have to do a little test plot to see what the weather conditions are, because it's um, obviously very important. So you've put a little bit of an accelerant on there. Now you've Just lit it. Yep. Now, how's it look? It looks pretty good. We have a southwest wind and we're in the northeast corner right where we want to be and uh, if this wind stays stable, it's pretty light, we should be in good shape to finish this burn. So the wind is blowing against the flames and that's what we want. We don't want the wind to take the flames away, is that that's right? That's right. We want a controlled fire backing into the wind and right now that's what we have. Well, Gretel, your, your helper is going to start this fire ablaze and as you can see here, the Bell Live team is suited up for safety and we're going to let you know what they're wearing and they have water in those tanks and they're wetting down the side here to make sure that nothing happens and make sure that uh, the prairie um, grass fire is completely prescribed and also very safe and as you can see here we're starting the fire and it's very exciting and it'll take about uh, 45 minutes for this fire to burn this entire half acre and we're going to be checking in a couple of times with you Brian to see how everything is going the smoke's coming right at us so everything is good right now we're going to toss it back to you Vanita over there, Belinda. It looks like a lot of fun, though. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I am getting fired up for this adventure. So let's get going. Take it away with Bell Live 99 on the Prairie.
Hop on board everyone, it's a Great Plains Prairie Adventure. Today, the flowers and plants and grasses that make up the Blue Stem Prairie Preserve. Living here are millions of insects, from beetles to butterflies, and everything in between. And we'll catch some for you. We'll also catch and take some small prairie animals and talk about the big ones like the buffalo. We've also got a guest appearance from the prairie chicken, the kettle drum of love with Cupid's wings. And a Native American Dakota tells us how Indians lived on the prairie. And don't forget fire, it brought destruction and life to the tall grass prairie. Stay there, here we come with Bell Live on the Prairie. As you just saw, there is just so much to experience in this next hour, so much to learn. But before we can really get into all that, we have to figure out exactly where we are. And we have a Bell Live team member right here to help us out with that. His name is Phil. Well, right now we're in the upper Midwest United States, northwest Minnesota. We're just east of the city of Moorhead. And all around us are the beach ridges of the ancient glacial lake of um, Agassiz, ancient glacial lake Agassiz. Now, believe it or not, 18,000 years ago, everything you see here was underwater. Take a look at this video from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to see it a better idea of what I'm talking about. Now, the water in Lake Glacial Lake Agassiz was brought there by glaciers, which covered all of Canada and mo lots of the northern United States back in the last ice age. Now, those glaciers were rivers of ice over a mile thick in places that scraped the ground and deposited sand, gravel, and rocks all over Minnesota, creating many of Minnesota's common landforms. Now, 10,000 years since the glaciers retreated, the vegetation in Minnesota has changed quite a bit due to changes both in precipitation and temperature over time. As the climate got warmer and drier, the prairies moved to the northeast part of the Midwest. And as it cooled down, the prairies moved to where they are currently in Minnesota. Now coniferous trees, northern hardwoods, and deciduous forests flourish there. If you think that's cool, you should see what Elaine has going on out at the production van. Elaine? Hi, I'm Ileana Farhat. This electronic field trip brought to you today is the work of a lot of technology. We beam a satellite message up into space, 22,000 miles. A satellite in space then transmits it back to receiver at your school and that's how you're seeing this picture today. This right here is our production van. In here is all of our production crew. Let's go inside and meet them. In here we have our director Terry Devine and our producer Mike Gady. Hi guys, wave with the camera. Don't forget to check out our website. It's flashing on your screen right now. It'll, you'll be able to see it throughout the whole broadcast. Let's go over to the laptop and look at the site. On it, you can find a Build a Prairie Game. On the Build a Prairie Game, you can make flowers. Um, you can either build a tall grass or short grass prairie. You learn what birds live here and what insects. Let's look at it. Right now, there's a bird flying across your screen, and you program that bird to be there. Um, why don't you ask a question, and you can go on to our website and ask questions on the we website. We have to toss it out to uh, Belinda now for the fire. Okay, let's go out to Belinda at the fire. Did you know, in the past, wildfires were sparked by lightning and were quite frequent? Well, this fire is moving fast, and we are really keeping an eye on it, aren't we, Brian? We're continuing to back up, so don't mind that as we go on, because it is moving pretty fast. But once again, the wind is coming this direction, and we're burning into the wind, and that's why it's not just taken off. That's right. It's a, it's a controlled fire because it is backing into the wind, and our wind is pretty stable right now, which is helping us. Because our temperature is up and our fuel is a lot drier, though, yep. it's burning hotter, and the backfire is moving quicker than in our previous some of our previous burns. And, you know, this is when the fires burn the fastest. This is in the fall, because as you can see here, the grasses are very dry. The Bell Live team is helping um, Brian's folks by watering down the line so that the fire doesn't spread. And of course, they're in safety gear. And Molly, why don't you come on over here and we'll uh, talk to, about exactly what they're wearing in order to keep them safe. And we're continuing to back up here. Yes, we got the fire at our heels. Um, 
that what she's wearing a, what we call a banana suit. It's basically a Nomex coveralls, fire retardant materials. In addition, we have the hard hat with a face shield and a neck protector, um, as well as leather gloves and boots to help protect her from the flames and heat. And what does she have on her back? And that's an Indian backpack pump can. It holds five gallons of water, and it's a real important tool for us to keep the fire where we want it, so it is a controlled burn. Okay, we'll put you back to work, Molly, but let's have you go that way so you'll be safe And uh, because, of course, the fire is kind of moving in here yeah. pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, we have a question coming in from the Bell Museum. Can you remind me the name again that's coming in from the Bell? Oh, hi, Kimberly from the Bell Museum in Minneapolis. Good afternoon. Hi. What's your question? Okay, about, about how much of the prairie land is burned when there is a prairie fire. Okay, she is wondering how much of the prairie land is burned when there is a prairie fire. Like, what's a normal tract that if you were working that you would burn? Okay, well, what we one one of our rules is we'll never burn more than half of the prairie. In today's landscape, we have very small prairie remnants, and we want to leave part of the prairie unburned so all of the insects, birds, small mammals have places to live while the other part is renewing after the burn. So no more than half, and usually it's less than that. So we have to get to the question that, you know, I don't know if we've answered this or not, but, but why are we burning the prairie? Why are, you, why are you supposed to do this and why do you do this for a living? Well, fire is a natural disturbance or nat natural process that these prairies evolved under. And so to maintain this open grassland character, we need to use fires to uh, keep the, the woody vegetation, the willow and aspen and some of the other woody species in check. Yeah, and as you can see here, you know, we're looking across the area, and in the far distance, at least a couple miles away, you can see some trees. But the bottom line is they don't want trees. They don't want shrubs to grow on the prairie land. They just want these grasses to grow, and they want those hardy grasses to grow. And so burning down this every four years or so, really, we got to move again, yes, Brian. Here we go. Yes, <laughs> it's getting hot. Uh, every four years or so, really get those hardy species to grow, and that's what we're after. Exactly. This fire um, does such good things to stimulate these native prairie plants. Yeah. Well, once again, as we mentioned, we have about a half acre here that we're going to burn. So how long are you going to let this go until we start the backfire to really, or the head fires, to meet up with it? We're going to let this burn for uh, another few minutes. It, we already have a pretty good wide black line yeah. so that the head fire wouldn't cross that. Ooh, uh, but first we need to finish this side and work our way around in what we call a ring firing technique to get around this unit. All so right. in about the way things are burning right now, this fire will probably be over in 15 minutes or so. It's exciting. It's so exciting here on Bell Live. We're going to be coming back two more times to see how this fire is going and let you know what it looks like when it's all done. Also, we found a little hole where we think some little animals probably retreated when the fire happened. So we're going to talk about where they go and what happens to them, to the insects and to the mammals when a fire happens. And speaking of mammals, coming up in just a couple of seconds, Vanita is going to be talking to a mammologist. Now, a mammologist is a biologist who specializes in mammals. I bet you figured that out. And the uh, person that we're going to be talking today is Donna Bruins Stockram, and she is in charge of categorizing and finding all these critters in the prairie. Did you know every day a metavole eats an amount of food equal to 60% of its body weight? No, I did not know that. I have here with me a woman who does know that, Donna Bruns Stockroom from Moorhead State University. Her research assistants, Deanna Thompson and Heather Taylor, are here as well. And we've got the Bell Live team to help us out, too. Donna, the importance of mammals in the prairie. Why don't you fill us in on well, that? Well, we're studying here today small mammals. So we're looking mainly at mice, shrews, and voles. And uh, they're very important in the food chain because you can't have larger mammals or birds of prey unless you have these small mammals for them to eat. For you to research it, you have to actually trap these animals, yes, right? Yes, do live trapping. Why don't you show us exactly okay. how that works? Um, what we have here is a, a runway. This is made by uh, a metal bowl. And if you can take a look down here, we have the clippings that these mice, I shouldn't say mice, that these voles make. And uh, what they're trying to do is get to the top of the seed heads up here, but this is a long stem, so they cut little short pieces, pile it down there at the base so they could actually get to this this stem. So they're very important in the prairie ecosystem because they also help disperse seeds and recycle the nutrients. How far apart do you set these traps? Usually it's about 10 meters depending uh, what kind of study you're doing. We usually go at 10 meters because you can catch an animal here. Also in the next trap you can get movement data that way. Okay, we've got the Bell Live team back here to help us out with exactly how you set up these traps and what gets these, you know, voles and even mice to come into the traps. Go ahead. Well, uh, this is the trap we use. This is the front where the animal comes in, and this is the back. And we put uh, some bait in the back. The bait is a mixture of peanut butter and, uh, like, oats. 
But see, that's interesting. And, they, uh, they like peanut butter, huh? Yeah, that's not what they normally eat, but uh, you know, it smells different and it smells good, so they they come into the trap and get caught. Okay. And so you put a little dab of it back here. Okay. And what's next? Uh, then. Uh, all right, then you put a little bit of cotton inside the trap, so um, when the mouse or meadow vole gets caught, um, that way he can, nestle, he can nestle in there so he won't get cold or anything. Just in case he's in there for a while. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you close it and you just pat it down just to make sure everything's off this. And when you set it down, you open this here. And then when the animal runs in there, it um, falls on a trestle. And then when they fall on the trestle, it closes and then they're in there. Okay, we have a question from Angela in Andover, Minnesota. Go ahead, Angela. I was wondering, what's the most common animal on the prairie? What is the most common animal on the prairie? Good question, Angela. Well, if you're talking about mammals, probably one of the most common would be the meadow vole, which we'll show you here in a minute. Okay, now show us what happens. Okay, you open okay, up the trap. This is an animal we caught this morning. You take the trap, have a plastic bag, and gently Get the animal to go in there. Because it didn't want to come <laughs> there out. He goes. All right. Oh, you guys, take a look at this. Now the, the we got a long tail here. So would that be a mouse or would that be a vole? Probably a mouse. Okay. Take a look at the tail. Look, it's it's dark on the top and it's light on the bottom. No. What is the difference? How do you differentiate? Uh, well, this would be a deer mouse because that coloration of the tail is very distinctive for the species. So we know that we have a, a deer mouse. There's a close related species. Uh, White-footed mouse, but we mainly catch deer mice around here. Is this hurting? The no, mouse? I hold them gently by the back of the scruff of their neck, and this uh, this is a little girl. Looks like it's not very well developed yet, so it's probably uh, a young one. Okay, let's take a tail measurement here real quickly while we got the animal. Is this part of your whole research process? Is to measure? Yeah, the there's tail? certain measurements we take for species identification, also age. So what do we got here? It's about 600 meters. Millimeters. Millimeters. Yeah. That would be a long tail. <laughs> uh, probably, probably 60, right? 60. 60. Okay, we'll get that on the data. Here, let's weigh this animal quickly. While I'm doing this, why don't you guys uh, maybe show them the meadow vole, another species we catch around here. Why is it important to record all of this data when you're doing this research? Okay, we look at the, the health of the, the animal population. Also, we can look at reproductive rates. Um, if you have a healthy mammal population, a lot of times it keeps the, the prairie uh, in good shape. Okay. So okay, we how, have how a many grams question? here? About 25 grams. 25 grams. We have a question okay. from Anthony in Wisconsin okay. Rapids, I think it was. Anthony, Rapids? go ahead. Um, do you know what, is, or what would be a safe way to handle animals? What would be a safe way to handle these animals? Are you concerned okay. at all about them biting you or yes, anything? Yes, and I know how to get them by the back of the neck. For something bigger like a rabbit, though, what we do is we have special handling bags that are like a, a, a triangle in shape, so you can hold the end of the... Uh, the bag to the end of the trap, the animal runs into the bag, and then they run down to the tapered end, so you can sort of trap them there and hold them safely and okay. gently, not hurt you or the animal. Okay, we want to quickly show the okay. antenna. Uh, what is this used for? Go ahead, Deanna. This is our radio telemetry unit, and we use this to track the animals, and this is the collar that goes around the neck. This is used for a little bit larger animals than what we have shown here. They make smaller collars. There's a battery in here for the power, and then a transmitter that emits a beep, and which is picked up by the antenna and brought back here. Let's hear what it sounds okay. like. This is really cool, students, back in your classrooms. Take a listen. That clicking noise is what is picked up by the receiver. So then you know you're honing in on that mammal that you've tagged. Yep. Very interesting. Thank you so much to our research assistants, Donna, and our Bell Live team. Now, Belinda is away from all that smoke, and now she's talking about plants. She's with Peter Bissler. He's with the Department of Natural Resources. He's a state prairie biologist and a prairie plant expert. Do you know that grasslands can be found on every continent except Antarctica? That's right, everywhere except Antarctica, but I don't think any of them are as beautiful as this prairie. This is a bunch of blue stem uh, plants here, and it is just gorgeous here. You know, there's so many plants and so many flowers and so many grasses to, uh, to look at and identify. It would just take all day to do that. You know, in the 1800s, when the pioneers came through here, they used to look across this prairie and say, that looks a lot like the sea of grass, which I think is a very good description of that. And I know one guy in particular that hopes that that sea just continues to grow, and that's Peter Bissler. How are you doing, Peter? Oh, doing real great. You talk, 
You talk about that sea of grass. And oh, that, it's that extended from here all the way to the Rocky Mountains, from southern Canada all the way down to Texas. A quarter of the continent was once grass. And we have a lot of uh, listeners and a lot of uh, kids that are watching us from the Rocky Mountains westward. And, mm. and, you know, there's not that much left of this. And so it is wonderful to look at it. And, uh, you know, of course, it's October. So we're getting ready here in Minnesota for winter, along with all of you in all your states, getting ready for winter. And so is the prairie. But how beautiful is this in the summertime? Well, it's really quite colorful. You just see the, the golden color right now, but during the summer there's the galardia that you see there, uh, yellow, orange type uh, sunflower. Uh, this here is called loco weed, a uh, purple bean legume kind of plant uh, that grows on a dry prairie. You're looking at buffalo bean there, that's actually the fruit of a plant that's really quite edible. Uh, and this here is the prairie rose. Just beautiful, and every single week a new flower blooms around here. It certainly here. does. So, it makes it exciting to come out and see what's new. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, uh, of course, this prairie is named after the blue stem grass, which is mm -hmm. behind us. And this is an amazing root system, and I think that's the most important part of this, is that this is just the tip of the iceberg? It sure is. Most of the living matter of prairie is actually underneath the ground. Uh, it can extend down 9, 10, 11, 12 feet. Oh, that's great. And we have some examples for you. We want to let you know about that. We have uh, Nina and Jameson. How are you guys doing? And we also have Shubang and uh, Amanda. They're uh, identifying some plants. But we're going to show people how long this root system is. So, Nina, you hold it there. And, Jameson, you go back nine feet and then stop. There we go. That's how long the roots are of these blue stem uh, prairie grasses. So we're talking some deep roots and also some really fertile soil, huh? It is. That big root mass of those plants it wasn't just straight down. It was a big group of plant uh, material mm -hmm. that as it decays turns into this black yeah. fertile soil that these uh, farmers depend on out here. Well, we have a question coming in from Lake Minnetonka, Minnesota, and her name is Margaret. Margaret, good afternoon. Hi. Hi. What's your My question? question is what kind of prairie plants would make you itch? Oh, would make you itch? Well, one that you're probably familiar with, poison ivy, which you think of maybe as a woodland type plant, actually does grow out on the prairies, on the edges of the woods, and often way out in the middle of a prairie. And that certainly can make you quite itchy. So poison ivy grows here too, and along yes, with on the does. forest floor. Hey guys, why don't you come on over here? We're going to talk about vegetables. You might not think that in the prairie there's some vegetables, but there's a number of them. And this one uh, is one that's all dried up, but it used to be a pretty fertile ve vegetable, right? Yeah, this is the Indian turnip or tipson. Uh, in the summertime, early summer, this would have a light green fuzzy kind of leaf. And this is the flower, actually, where the flower once was, a deep purple. Uh, this was the most widely gathered uh, food plant and used by the Plains Indians. At its base, uh, underneath the ground, about six inches, there's a egg size uh, turnip kind of bulb, which was mm -hmm. peeled and eaten raw, or it was boiled, or it was dried, and then pounded later on in the winter time as a starch kind of meal. So kind of almost like an onion. That's right. Yeah. Now they had to collect it early in the summer because a little later on it does dry up and blows away, uh, and it's <laughs> a tumbleweed basically. <laughs> All right, let's move back. We've got another beautiful flower, and maybe some of your parents grow this. You might want to ask them when you get home today. They might grow this in their backyard because it's become a really big perennial, and that's the purple cone flower. And this thing has lots of value to uh, to the Native Americans when they lived here, and then also to everyone else. That's right. It's a medicinal plant. It was used by the Native Americans for a variety of ailments, but in particular, it was used as an antiseptic, something that would uh, kill pain. Uh, they would take the root in particular, uh, cut a piece of it, and if they had a toothache, they would chew on that for a while. It would make it go numb, just like Novocaine. If you had a snake bite or an insect bite, you might rub it on top of you. Uh, so it was used for a lot of purposes like that. That's, and it's, it's really obviously going into its winter stage, so it's really pretty. Feel this, you guys. If you want to put these roots on your tongue, you basically could. I mean, if you had a toothache, you could put pull it up now even in the winter time and use the roots for yep. those. Yep, uh, and in the summertime really the whole plant has that same feature and you can take a seed and, and chew on it and it'll make it go numb. I don't recommend that to anybody, you don't know who's going to be allergic to it, but yeah. it has those kind of qualities. Actually today you can find it in health food stores uh, under the name of Echinacea. It's used as a, a typically in a pill form or a tea form mm -hmm. uh, and it's grown often in Germany, actually, is where most of it comes from, yeah. uh, and they distribute it to help you stop getting colds. Yeah, I mean, if a lot of you have colds or, or the flu, I bet your parents probably gave you some echinacea tea, and I bet maybe some of you as well. We have a question coming in from Wisconsin Rapids. We have Lisa on the line. Good afternoon. Hello. Oh, we're not sure if Lisa, maybe she's sneezing. Maybe she didn't get the answer. Oh, do you have a question Hello? for us? Hello. How warm does the ground have to be for prairie plants to grow? Thank you very much from Wisconsin Rapids. Good question. Well, 
two parts to that question. Once these things really don't die, in the winter time the top dies out, but we talked about how much living matter is underneath the ground. Just like a tree drops its leaves, it's still alive in the winter time, and these plants are alive all year round too. Uh, but in terms of active regrowth that you see above the ground, this is almost what we call a warm season kind of habitat. So it's probably late May that these grasses and flowers start uh, mm -hmm. coming on really strong. And they're starting to hibernate like most of the plants uh, in the northern states do. And so if you're uh, watching us from the northern states, you know how that works. All the leaves fall off the trees and everything starts to hibernate. That's well, right. Peter, thanks so much for all your information. Sure. And I don't know if you guys should get very comfortable because do you realize how many centipedes are probably right underneath you right now? Yes, I'm talking centipedes. You know, the, the prairie would not do very well. <laughs> They're looking around. The prairie would not do very well without plant diversity. And it also wouldn't do well without insects. And we're going to be talking about the creepy crawly things coming up in just a couple of minutes. But right now, we want you to pull out your worksheets, your bird data, and also your worksheets on vegetation. And there's a reason we want you to do that because Austin here actually has some of that vegetation data for you. So take a second here, pull those out, and Austin will read off that data that they've been collecting. Go ahead. All right. Um, our first question was, how would you describe the landscape of your study? So to that, obviously, is a nature reserve. This is the Nature Conservancy. Our second question was, how would you describe the ecosystem of your study site? And the ecosystem here is mixed uh, grassland with clumps of trees. A third question was, how would you describe the land use of your study site? And this is, this is a wild area. Our fourth question was, how would you describe the land use of the area surrounding your study site? And that, for the most part, is also wild. Uh, the fifth question was, what percentage of each of the fine vegetation types cover your study sites? 10% uh, of it is mature tall trees, 20% uh, tall shrubs, short trees, 30% low shrubs, 40% small plants, and 0% pavement and buildings. Uh, the sixth question is, are there any fallen or, s fallen or standing dead trees in your study site? And there are less than 1% dead trees in the study site. Uh, this next thing up on your screen is our bird census. These are all birds that we found in our three uh, bird census trials we took on the study site. Okay, very extensive list. Thanks a lot, Austin. Now, remember, we're going to keep checking back on that fire where Belinda was. We're going to do that right now. Thanks. You know, uh, Vanita, it is really roaring behind me. We don't, we don't want to get too close without the fire gear. That's why we're standing here. But obviously, all the Bell Team Live members and Brian and their crew are all in their gear. And as you can see, the smoke has taken over. The flames are really coming together. So I think that they started the head fire. The head fire is meeting that back fire. And as the fires come together, it all is going to stop. You wonder what happens to the critters that live there. We're going to check out that, see how many holes we can find where the critters have probably run down into the ground. We're also going to let you know what it looks like when the fire's out, what they have to do in order for it to keep it out and have everything uh, be safe. And we'll check on all those things coming up in just a couple of minutes. But it's really roaring behind us. Lots of smoke, lots of swirling action. It's very exciting here on the prairie. Now back to you. I guess you have some creepy crawly critters with you. Did you know that one out of every five known species is a beetle? We've got a great segment for you here. I have two entomologists with me. How many people know what an entomologist is? Can you yell it out? An insect expert. Dave Ryder and Paul Tinarella from North Dakota State University. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. And tell us about the importance of insects on the prairie. Well, they, they play a very important role. There's more insects out here than everything else combined, and, and they affect everything out here. There's insects that pollinate the plants, there's insects that feed on the plants, insects that feed on uh, animals and birds, um, and they all play an important part of the uh, food chain also. So they're very vital for, for the ecosystem out here, okay, so very important. Some, you've got some great examples for us. Go ahead and Dave, go through some of these. In this drawer we have uh, a number of things that are typical of what you might find in Minnesota. A few dragonflies, some grasshoppers, uh, walking stick, uh, cockroach, giant water bug, even some bees and wasps. So just a few things that we might be able to find in Minnesota. How dangerous are these insects? Could you get hurt if they bit you? Or? Most of these things, no. Uh, the giant water bug can bite if you get up by its head, and of course some of the bees and wasps will sting in that. But for the most part, these things are fairly harmless. What is the most common one? Uh, I don't even know if we've got any in here. The ants. Ants are very common out here. Um, of course, they don't display as well. Okay. A lot of the grasshoppers are fairly common. That's 
We have a question from Pat at the Bell Museum in Minneapolis. Go ahead, Pat. Um, is there any poisonous insects in the prairie? Are there any poisonous insects in the prairie? Uh, not many. There's a few that could be considered somewhat poisonous. There's some caterpillars that if they rub against your arm would cause a rash. Uh, there's a thing called a blister beetle that'll do the same thing. And as I said, some of the bees and wasps will sting. They, they kind of uh, emit a poison in their sting in that. So. Okay, Paul, why don't you show us your collection? What I've got here is, are some beetles. This is a drawer of beetles from my research out here on the ground, uh, all ground beetles. And uh, a few different kinds in here, but what I've looked at so far in the years of the study from about 95 to 99 are about uh, 40,000 individuals that break out into about 110, 120 species. I've got the caterpillar hunter here, Calisoma colitum. This is usually up on vegetation. And uh, some of the uh, other beetles represented here are tiger beetles. They're more on, they occur on drier habitats or sandier habitats. And uh, so quite the uh, beetle assemblage out oh, here yeah. on the prairie. Okay, we've got some Bell Live team members out there doing some strange things on the prairie. Tell us about that, Paul. Well, they're using uh, one of our many techniques to collect insects. This is an active technique, the sweep net, using the sweep net to sweep the vegetation to uh, see what they can find there. And that's uh, one of our active techniques. We have multiple passive techniques, such as the tent you see back there. It's a malaise trap. We have for... a question from Nick in Wisconsin. Go ahead, Nick. Um, hi. Um, I was wondering, how many species of insects are there in a prairie? How many species of insects are there in a prairie? We've, uh, so far, we've documented about 850 species out here, uh, but that's only a few of the groups that we've looked at. We think that it'll probably go as high as 2,000 to 2,500 species on the prairie. Okay, we have a question from Jenny in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Go ahead, Jenny. What is the smallest animal on the prairie and what does it eat? The smallest animal or smallest insect? She's asking, sm let's go with smallest insect, because that's insect. your expertise. There are some insects that are very, very tiny. We've got a couple of microscope slides of them there uh, called the uh, Protura. Some of them are called uh, springtails, but they're very tiny microscopic, and they probably feed on leaf litter or just detritus or uh, rotten plant material in the soil. Okay, we have some video of Paul actually collecting some of these insects, and why don't we roll that video on Paul, and you can describe what you were doing. Sure. Here I've got a, uh, another passive collecting technique, the pitfall trap, and I've just pulled a cup out of the, uh, the trap itself, and we're taking a look at the contents. There's some carrion beetles here, which are quite common in our pitfall traps. Um, they can occur in quite high numbers there. What is that green liquid? That's uh, ethylene glycol. Okay. We use it as a preservative. Uh, got me sweeping using the uh, sweep net here. About to pull that open, and we're going to see what we've got. Quite a bit of stuff I would assume is going to come out of here. And uh, we'll look there. The first thing that comes out is a, an assassin bug. And uh, these are fairly common on the prairie out here. Quite the voracious predator for their size. Sure. We have a question from Brooke at Meadow Creek School. Go ahead. Um, hi. I was, wa I was wondering if there's any bugs you can only find on prairie. Are there any bugs you can only find on the prairie? Oh sure, there's there's a number of things that would be restricted to prairies. Uh, some of the various butterflies especially are only going to be able to be found uh, on the prairies. Uh, so yeah, there's a number of things that are occur here and nowhere, nowhere else. Okay, Micah, you're going to help us with the trapping situation that you've got going there. Why don't you show us what he's doing, Paul? Well, here we've got an actual pitfall trap that has been running. And Mike is going to pull the cup up and we're going to bring it over and uh, dump it out into this enamel pan and we're going to take a look at what we've got here. Ooh, what we've students actually... that, ooh, students in the classroom are probably saying gross right now. Yes, indeed. So we've got a, a fair amount of material in here. Um, many millipedes, these are not insects, they're related to insects. We've got a ground beetle here. Um, Paul, crickets. Yeah. Paul, we have a question from Aaron in Waconia as you go through that. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, um, why do they call a blister beetle a blister beetle? Ooh, why do they call a blister beetle a blister beetle? Well, the blister beetle, um, what happens, it secretes a, a chemical that causes a blister on the skin uh, should, should we touch it. And uh, that's uh, 
Um, and can that be dangerous? I mean, is that just a little harmful little blister? Or is it, it can cause a, a localized blister that's, that's fairly painful, uh, depending on the certain species that you would contact. So, Dave, what do you think of your job out here? Oh, it's, the this is just wonderful. They, they play such an important role and we get a chance to study these insects both out here in the field and, and under the microscope in the laboratory where they really look neat. I uh, think they look neat here. Oh, yeah. Get them under the microscope. So we, we think it's just a fabulous job. Okay. Thank you so much for explaining all this to us. Very interesting. Now we're going to head over to Belinda who's with an expert on prairie chickens. This is really interesting. <laughs> Did you know the scientific and Latin name for the greater prairie chicken, Tympanucus cupido pinnatus, means kettle drum of love with cupid's wings? I'm sure glad I didn't have to say that. That's right, that's the scientific name. We're talking about the prairie chicken and it used to greet Native Americans and also the white settlers that came into this area with an amazing mating dance. The mating dance had a lot of sounds in it like cooing and stamping and stomping and booming and cackling and whooping, all those things you're gonna to do to your parents when you get home this afternoon. You have to see this to believe it. It can be pretty loud on the prairie in the evening hours on the booming ground, and we have a man who can tell us all about that. His name is John Tepfer, and he is a prairie chicken specialist. Welcome again this afternoon, John. Nice to see you. Good to be here. It's an amazing bird, lots of noises, a very exciting mating dance that they have. Yes, it is. The purpose of the booming ground is for the males to establish dominance. Uh, the hens are attracted to the booming. They come on and visit the males and then select which individuals they're going to breed with and in most cases on a single booming ground one or two individuals do most of the breeding. So it's a lot of bullying around and yes. whoever's the biggest bully we know how that works in schools. Well that's a we're talking about a male um, uh, prairie chickens. This is a female prairie yes. chicken and this is uh, just so beautiful. Look at all these colors in the feathers of obviously wonderful camouflage. And for those of th those of you that live in states where there's grouse it, it's one of the grouse in the family of those? Yes the real common name for it should be called a pinnated grouse, uh, but it's uh, in many places there are common names of prairie chickens for many different birds. It's beautiful. You know, early this morning we were here uh, before sunrise and we were uh, checking out the cameras to see what the prairie looked like and it was just gorgeous in the morning with the fog lifting and this is what we saw. So we started rolling tape and we saw some prairie chickens right out here on this prairie. Yeah, there's a booming ground behind us about a half a mile and these birds were night roosting uh, south of the road and flew out about a half a mile to visit the booming ground. The birds do, the males do visit the booming ground periodically during the fall and even into the winter. They're very tied to the display ground. Yeah, they're really good flyers too, very just soft. beautiful. Well, you actually, of course, research these animals and that means catching them and catching them means going out in the middle of the night. So we have some video of you going out and catching the birds and what you do with them. So we're gonna show that. Um, basically, first of all, why is it at night? Uh, that's really the only time we can go back uh, to recapture birds when they don't fly well in the summer molt. Uh, we can go out at night with a spotlight and uh, zero in on the birds with the radios and uh, pick them up. So first of all, the prairie chicken is what you're after, of course, and so you head out in the middle of the night and uh, you have some radio um, uh, antennas that you're using? Yes, uh, this is the tracking vehicle that we use to locate the birds at a distance. We can pick up the radios about a mile away. What's that uh, guy putting on He's there? putting on a backpack, a 12-volt battery on a backpack with a football helmet with a spotlight on. This allows us to work at night, provides us with light to see the birds and to, to, in some instances to uh, freeze the birds so we can net them. So he's got a light on top of yes. his helmet there. That's Gary Hushley with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, so now you're going to be heading out onto the prairie, and uh, how far away did you have to drive? Where do you live? Uh, this particular house was in Twin Valley, Minnesota. We had to drive about uh, 25 miles that night to locate a radio tagged female with her chicks uh, that were about 12 weeks of age at this point. And with that antenna on the car, I'm sure you get a few looks when you travel, yes. travel through town. All right, so now you're on the prairie, of course, and you're going to turn your uh, headlights off, but you're actually doing something within the cab of the truck there. Yeah, we're zeroing in on the radio signal. We'll drive within 100 yards with the truck, then we'll get out, load our equipment, uh, and then walk in closer with mobile handheld antennas to uh, spot the bird and then net it. 
And how do you know that you're coming upon um, a group of them? Uh, each bird has a, a radio on an individual frequency. Yes, uh, they're so all different beeps and yes. different sounds coming out of your, your yes. uh, transmitter. How many birds would probably uh, nest together at night? Uh, you may have anywhere from a hen with a brood will be her the female five or six chicks but sometimes you get flocks of 15 25 30 mm. together at night that must be exciting so here you're on the prairie and you're listening and i think you found one and we've that located is, bird that's been sleeping yes so then the sound gets quicker and uh, runs a little bit faster yes and there uh, the bird flushes uh, it'll come back again in slow motion you can see with the bird takes off and we net it how, how did you catch it then it was netted with we use a net about with a 10 foot pole on it you're uh, not hurting. No, her the birds at all. are handled carefully, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, so you caught a young one here. This is a 12-week-old bird, a young male. Young male, and that's the key. You want to catch them really young and find yes. out where they are born and where they die and what they do in between. So yes. now you have it, and to keep it calm, you've put it in a dark box. Yes, uh, it keeps them calm in the dark. They don't jump around and hurt themselves. Uh, we take the birds out now. I'm putting it in a uh, stocking cap. The stocking cap will confine the bird, so we can place it on a scale and weigh it. And how much do they weigh into small males like that? Two to two and a half pounds. Mm, so pretty good size. Now you're taking a few feathers from yes, him. That's for ge genetic purposes and then also for to look at chemical contaminants that they may have picked up. Not too many uh, feathers. There's one of our, there's Jameson again from our Bell Live. He's Lodge. recording the data. We're measuring the foot and the tarsus here to get an index to body size and growth. Now look at how calm he is. He's just sitting well, there. Well, he's, he's confined. Uh, his wings are being held and his legs are being held. And he's, between my legs. Yeah. Here we're taking a drop of blood. And you're doing that because? We'll use part of it for genetics and then as you'll see we're going to put part of it uh, on a slide and uh, that slide will be smeared and we'll look at the blood smear for blood parasites. Okay, so you're trying to find out if, if these birds are dying of disease and the blood will be a telltale sign yes. for that and so that's why you're taking the blood sample and uh, you're getting all this within about a half hour, yes. and then of course you're putting on this band. We're banding the bird here with an individual band that has a number on it, tells us who it was, and also tells people to contact us if they find it. And mostly if you find it again, you know you've already found it. Oh, okay. so one last thing to do here. Yes. <laughs> We're taking uh, feces or droppings, uh, fecal dropping, taking a sample that will be looked for to will be examined for internal parasites. Last but not least, huh? that's yes. always the final thing. But obviously that tells you a lot as well. Yes. And so now you've done all that, you've uh, collected all that data, so you know a ton about this little bird, and you're going to release him now. Yes. And you're going to, before well, you release him, you're going to put that radio collar yes. on. We almost forgot. That's a really good idea. Now, that is something that the battery lasts for an hour. One year. Putting it right over yeah, his head. Yeah, it goes over their head. If the, we find a radio without a bird, we know the bird's head has been severed. Uh, it's placed under the feathers. It cannot be seen outside uh, uh, outside the bird. Nothing hangs out. And then we will release the bird. So that keeps on for his whole life. Okay, yeah. so now we're going to release it. And in order to release it, you have to do, you actually have to make it kind of dizzy? We have a special technique. We spin the birds at night uh, to place them down so they're disoriented so they don't fly into the dark and run into a fence or into a telephone wires or run into a predator. Yeah, so that, that is a great idea. We're not hurting it once no. again. Just making it a little dizzy so he, you know, he doesn't fly away and get hurt by the yes. truck or anything else. We'll place him down. He won't flush. He'll stay there till the next morning and wake up and not know what went on. Just like if you were with one of your friends and you spun around for a while and then tried to get to your desk and got a little dizzy. You yes. know how that works. <laughs> it is really a neat thing. I mean, that you did all this and you obviously found out a lot of information. We have a caller on the line with a question from Minneapolis, Amy. Good afternoon, Amy. Hi, my question... My question is, um, what kind of enemies does the prairie chicken have? Mm. Uh, that is a great question because yes we should show this. Speaking of enemies, here are some birds that were killed by enemies, right? Yes. And we have the carcasses left, and you can tell these are birds that were banded and were being watched because you can see the bands on their legs. Now, how did these get killed? Uh, both of these were killed by raptors. This one was buried in a field in a plow. But we can tell by the bones being stripped and then by stripped tendons, only raptors or hawks and owls with their bills will pull the meat off, pick it off, and then they'll leave a coiled tendon. Oh. So sometimes we find birds that are chewed on by foxes or coyotes. But it won't look like no, this. It won't it'll look be like more mangled. It'll be all chewed up. All chewed up. So we're talking about owls and raptors that are live in trees. And that's another reason that these fires are important because we don't want trees on the prairie, no. right, John? Uh, if a Raptor, horned owl, or red-tailed hawk can't get within a quarter to a half mile of a prairie chicken is going to have a hard time killing it. Well, that's a good thing, and that's why it's wonderful that the trees are way off in the distance, so the prairie chicken has a big area to live. John, you've been wonderful and just a wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate you coming out today. Thank you for having me.
All right, now that you know about the prairie chicken, we want you to learn a little bit more about that dance because we think that might be a fun thing to do this afternoon. And we're going to teach you that dance in just a couple of minutes with Franklin Firesteel. Did you know that only 13 people in Minnesota are fluent in the Dakota language? And our host researcher, Franklin Firesteel, is one of them. And here he is, Franklin Firesteel. He's a Dakota Indian, and this is going to be an exciting part of the electronic field trip because you guys are going to get involved. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you all to stand up, including the teachers, because we're going to have you doing the prairie chicken dance. Franklin's going to teach us how to do it. But first, we want to learn more about what this prairie was like more than 100 years ago. Franklin? More than 100 years ago, this prairie provided a re really uh, lavish lifestyle for the Dakota people here. Not only was there buffalo and deer, um, and a, a lot of other small game, but there was also fowl, fish. North of here, there was wild rice uh, lakes, and then there was also um, uh, the food that's most common in all of our uh, soups is the prairie tipsana, or the wild turnip. What is the significance of the prairie chicken dance? The prairie chicken dance was, was actually a, a mating ritual with the, uh, with the shio, or the prairie chicken. However, it was adopted into a social dance found at all, almost all of our functions that are Dakota people. Okay, let's go through here the importance of the buffalo to the Dakota people and how they use the buffalo. Why don't you explain uh, this? The buffalo, uh, the prairie buffalo, uh, provided us with shelter, food, and clothing. Okay. This here is a buffalo hide here. And this was tanned with the hair on one side. So what this would then use for is like a, a, a robe for a blanket. Uh, it could have been used for um, stuff making pillows out of. Uh, everything on the buffalo was utilized. Um, the skull of the buffalo became our altar and, uh, and also a very um, a religious symbol. Uh, the horns could be carved into cups and spoons, ladles. Okay. We, uh, we have a question from Jason in Wisconsin Rapids. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jason. Do you have a question for Franklin, Jason? About how many Native Americans live in the Midwestern prairies? How many Native Americans live in the Midwestern prairies? Uh, today? Or today. I think he's today. thinking about today. Uh, I believe in, in around here, somewhere between 70 and 80,000, something like that. Okay. But that's to include uh, Wisconsin, part of South Dakota as well. Before we get into the dance, I want to talk about what you're wearing. Okay. Talk about your headdress. That's so beautiful. The headdress is what is called a wapesha. And this, this sort of headdress is made out of um, porcupine guard hair. And the red part that you see up here, this is deer tail, dyed red. And if you see from the side, there are sockets holding eagle feathers in place. Uh, this type of headdress is worn up in this area uh, for many years, many hundreds of years. Okay, students, listen to this. Can you shake your... What is that? These are deer hooves. And these we use for uh, noisemakers when we dance before the introduction of metal bells to the prairie. Uh, these are collected from the, the hooves of deer. Okay. Casey, uh, we have a question from Casey in Minneapolis. Go ahead, Casey. Um, how, did, how did fires affect the Indians? How well, did fires affect the Indians? Prairie fires? Yes. Well, they could be very devastating. I mean, in the old days, they were something very hard to live with. Uh, uh, but probably the best thing that they could do was if a prairie fire ever got started was to get up and leave, <laughs> that's leave a the good, area. That's a good plan. Tell us about the stick you're holding. The you. stick, this here is a horse dance stick. Uh, this is uh, typical of our, of our culture, which is a prairie and plains culture, that you would make something to honor the horse that, that took you hunting and, and took you on, on, uh, into battle or moved your people. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is the time. Everybody get up, students, teachers, everyone, and we're going to bring the Bell Live team around. And Franklin is going to teach us how to do the prairie chicken dance, and it's different for the women and the men. Go ahead, Franklin. Yeah. The, the women actually do a sort of side shuffle where they move uh, legs at, uh, their toe heel just a little at a time. Okay? The men will actually uh, mimic the uh, prairie chicken as he's doing his um, mating ritual. Okay, okay. let's see it.
That is so excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your culture and your heritage with us. It's just fascinating. You're welcome. All right, we're going to head back over and check on that fire with Belinda. Well, we're back at the fire stop, uh, fire spot, and we have one acre burned today, so it is very exciting. Brian, everything was under control and yep. everything worked. Everything worked out very well. The fire is now out, and we're in what we call a mop up phase, and so we're just looking for any last little smokes or or little clumps of vegetation that are holding some fire and the students are putting those out so that we can leave here and know that the fire is contained and, and not gonna sort of flare back up and get out of the get out into the fuels of the vegetation that we didn't sure. want to burn. Because as you can see, it burned really fast and we have all this open prairie just off to our uh, to our west. Well, as you can see here, they're watering it down and they're also just using these little uh, rubber pads to push it down into... Yeah, uh, they're called a swatter and what they do mm -hmm. is just help smother the fire. So if they find a smoke, they can push, push that on there and it, prevents the oxygen from getting to it so the fire goes out. Now this is all black and it's October and now we you know get the bunch of snow up here in Minnesota and then after that of course in the spring this will probably melt first and start to grow pretty fast. Yes because it's black it's going to heat up faster and so this will green up very quickly in the spring and the native plants that like warmer soil conditions will come on real strong which is what we're after. Yeah. And then in addition this plant material that's been turned to ash is great fertilizer so it's also it's almost like a fertilizing event when we do these prescribed burns. So this black uh, soot is really like a lot of fertilizer. Now yep. you know we've been talking about critters and insects and we wonder hey what happens when it starts to burn and we were after the fire was over noticed this hole right here we noticed two things first of all we noticed this wasp nest tell us about that. Yeah, it's just a, a paper wasp nest. We should have the entomologist over here to learn more about yeah. it, but it's definitely one of the biting wasp nests, and I'm not sure where that would have been located, but uh, yeah, it looks like it, it inside the burrow underneath. I usually try to get under oh. something to keep stay out of the weather, and it might have been sitting there, and a mammal dug it out or something. Sure, so no trees for those uh, wasps, but look at this big hole that um, obviously when the fire comes across, those critters retreat to that hole. What do you think lived in there? Um, my guess is that uh, started off as a pocket gopher uh, mound and probably a badger, which is a real neat prairie mammal, came along and probably was looking for lunch and dug in to try to find that pocket gopher. Is what so the badgers guess. would kill the gophers? Exactly. See, now, if you're a Wisconsin fan, you know how excited I am right now. I'm from Wisconsin, so, you know, the bad. Okay, anyway, we'll just keep going on. So the badgers would go after the gophers, and they would dig up this hole. That's why there's probably all this soil here, and yep. then it would go after them. But but basically, when the fires come through, all the animals retreat underneath the ground, and they're right. fine. Yes, exactly. They have a variety of escape mechanisms. Some will go in their burrow. Some will just leave before we the disturbance of us getting around the unit. Some will fly away if it's birds. Um, and then many, many of the animals are just... Um, you know, have migrated for this yeah. time of year when it's fall burn. So they're a lot smarter than we are. Yeah. You know, they don't walk around in these banana suits and try to fight <laughs> these things. They actually just get out of the way. They're really, really smart. This has been just a wonderful experience to burn these down, and 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 you do this all the time. Yes, I've been doing this for 15 years, and. Uh, um, it's real satisfying because when you're done you can really see what you accomplished yeah. but more importantly when you come back the next year and see the results with controlled woody plants and the stimulated native uh, prairie grasses and all the flowering and mm -hmm. the high seed production it's really rewarding. I bet it is. We have a question from the Bell Museum in Minneapolis. Stephanie is on the line. Good afternoon Stephanie. Hi. I was, I was wondering how far a fire usually burns before it burns out. Oh how um well, I guess how far or how fast would a wildfire burn before it would actually burn out? Well, historically, when there were large expanses of grassland, it could burn for days until either a rainstorm came along that would put it out or until it hit a wide river or a series of lakes that would serve as a natural fire break. In today's landscape, because the prairie is so fragmented and they're very small places, if this place were to accidentally start on fire in a wildfire, it would burn to cultivated fields or drainage ditches. And so it varies tremendously on the site that you're at in terms of how far it would burn. But yeah. um, historically, so, they were very large. So if there was a river or a stream nearby, that would stop it. But in the past, there was, um, huge fires that took over a lot of acres. Hey, Brian, thanks so much for helping us out today. And Thank the Bell you. Live students have done such a great job. They and have. you know, um, the, the bottom line is we wouldn't even be here today. We wouldn't be able to talk about how beautiful this prairie is if it wasn't for the nature Conservancy. And now we have a message from Ron Nargang from the Nature Conservancy. For over 40 years, the Minnesota chapter of the Nature Conservancy has done its best to save a few great places. And the Blue Stem Prairie, where we're at today, is certainly one of those places. 
despite the fact that it's only a small remnant of the millions of acres of prairie that covered the northern Great Plains, it's really important that we have spots like this to be able to study the functions of, of prairie ecosystems. And it's been a particular pleasure for me today to watch these young people come out here and begin to get a grasp on the complex plant and animal communities that make up the tall grass prairie and, and I think as importantly to understand the natural processes like fire and their role in both creating the prairie and maintaining it. We're very pleased that Bell Live chose the Blue Stem Prairie as the site for this event today and we're very pleased that you all joined us. Thank you. Did you know you can restore a prairie by playing the Build a Prairie game on our website posted on your screen? We have done a lot here today. We figured out how to burn the prairie, what grows in the prairie, what you plant, what kind of animals are there. Now we've got to figure out how to put it all together. Ron Bowen with Prairie Restorations Incorporated and Teresa Rodriguez join us now. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. What is your company all about? Prairie Restorations is a company that really restores native plant communities. A lot of prairie, mostly prairie, and so we try and take um, what Mother Nature provides as examples and use it in what we call the built environment. The environment that's been destroyed or, that, that's the wrong word, disrupted, and then we try and fix it with prairie. Okay, we've got Bell Life team members over here actually doing some planting. Teresa, can you talk a little bit about what they're Absolutely. doing? Absolutely. There's a variety of uh, seeding techniques that we use. It can be as simple as just scattering the grass and wildflower seed or using what we call a hand crank. Um, but probably one of the most important steps involved in that, in that is getting the seed incorporated in the ground by using a rake. We have a question from Rhonda in Andover. Go ahead, Rhonda. Hi. Um, what is prairie restoration? What is the definition of prairie restoration? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. It's a, really a process of taking the species that we find on a remnant prairie, which is an undisturbed prairie, like we have here at Blue Stem, taking those species and trying to, to put them back together to basically rebuild the prairie and make it happy and content in the land that you planted on. So we're taking native seeds and, uh, of grasses and flowers, putting them back onto this site and trying to get them to to perpetuate themselves forever and ever. Okay, Ron, you've got this track, two tractors back here, and Ron's going to show us this one first. Why don't you? Okay. This tractor is hooked up to a seed drill, which is a specialized drill just for prairie. And if we look inside, this is the seed box. And if we can see inside here, this is prairie grass seed. And it's very light, chaffy, um, full of stems and pieces of plants that really are not seed. But we want the seed to go through this specialized machine down through these tubes and down into the ground below where the seed falls into the ground and gets planted more or less by this machine. Okay, well since we're over here now, why don't we start up this tractor okay. and go ahead and close that and see how this works. Okay, go Blaine, ahead. go ahead. This is really interesting because it's very even how it comes mm -hmm. out, right? Yes, this machine meters the seed very precisely, very carefully if you will. Now what we see here is a lot of soil, which we, I'm not here to show you, but I really want you to see this line of seed here, another line of seed here. This seed is being metered out by that drill and put in a very efficient fashion so that we're not wasting seed. Seed is hard to come by, it's expensive, and so we want to be as efficient as possible. Okay, let's head on over to Teresa with this other tractor. Can you tell us about how this one works? Right. This is, a, this is the mechanical means of doing what we call the hand scattering like the Bell Live team members were doing. This is called a Vicon Broadcast Seeder. And what it does is it, it spreads the seed out fairly evenly. And then what we've got on the back of this is what we call a drag harrow. It works like a rake. It incorporates the seed into the ground. Very interesting. Why don't we start up this one and just see how it works too. That would be great. This is so, and how do you know which one to use? Do you use both tractors? Um, oftentimes what we do, it depends upon how, how large the site is, we use this machine that uh, Jim is running on smaller sites, one, two, three acre projects, as opposed to the drill where we, where we use the drill on very large projects up to 100 acres in size. Okay, it's just fascinating and it's a very important thing to restore the prairie too. Yes, absolutely. Our mission really is to reincorporate native landscaping into the built world. And, and, and by doing that, we provide habitat, save water, um, really uh, so many positive things. And so 
when you plant these prairies, whether they're small or large, eventually we get more and more of this back. Good. And it, it's good for the world. Thank you so much. Let's bring in everybody. Belinda, the Bell Live team, all the researchers. We got to wrap things up today. It went by so fast. We had so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us for this electronic field trip in Bell Live. We really have had a good time and we hope that you've learned something today. And we want to let you know that, of course, a healthy prairie also means a healthy world. And all of us need to care about that. So have a great day and so long. Thanks a lot. We're going to leave you with the prairie chicken dance. The women doing their thing. And Franklin, go ahead, lead us. You can do this back in your classroom, too. You don't have to watch us. <laughs> Don't forget to join us next year as Bell Live heads to Lake Superior, the world's largest freshwater lake. We will explore Gitchagumi's ecosystem and see some of the strange creatures that call Superior home, like the lamprey and zebra mussel. We'll also look at the fish who live here, like brown trout and sturgeon, and those creatures that live on the bottom. We're planning on doing some water quality tests and show you the incredible beauty of the lake and its shore. That's all next year on Bell Live 2000 at Lake Superior.